harness or components, from the struts and joints to the most delicate electronic part. The dinosaur program calls for two kinds of boosters. First, for early test phases, modified Titan intercontinental ballistic missiles will be used. For the orbital mission, the booster must be quite large, equipped with tremendous power. The booster will be provided with large fins to offset the effect of the winged glider on the nose. And there's the sound of the booster engines. This in itself presents another engineering problem. Acoustic chambers are used to study the noise which will hammer away at the glider. Launching a pilot into space in such a hypersonic maneuverable glider as Dinosaur requires the most expert technical backup available. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration is participating with the Air Force in the Dinosaur program. NASA's experts bring to bear their long experience with various experimental programs. NASA's Mercury project, in which man rides a ballistic capsule into space and back, has been of value in the preparations for Dinosaur. And the X-15 program. This vehicle's pioneering flights have used control techniques that have been useful in the design and development of Dinosaur. A special centrifuge that resembles the Dinosaur cockpit has been used to determine the effectiveness of the pilot's capabilities under the G-forces he'll be exposed to during launch and re-entry. Protective pressure suits have been developed that provide the pilot with the freedom of movement within the confines of the cockpit. Exploration of glider handling qualities in the six degree of freedom flight simulator has been used as one basis of configuration determination and has familiarized the pilot with the glider's control responses. The men who fly Dinosaur will be specially trained test pilots selected for their adaptability and accommodation to the new conditions they'll be encountering. Before a man steps into a glider for his first flight, he will have been trained to handle his glider under any and all conditions. To carry the Dinosaur project to completion, an orderly flight test program has been planned. During the first phase, the pilot and glider will undergo airdrops from a mother ship. On these flights, the glider will use a rocket engine to achieve the necessary speed for a test of its aerodynamic characteristics and its functional subsystems. These airdrops will be followed by the launching of unmanned gliders for flights down the Atlantic Missile Range. Later, there will be piloted probes out over the Atlantic with landings at downrange sites. When all systems and components have been successfully tested, the dinosaur will be ready for its orbital mission. The pilot's safety is a prime consideration. During the preparations for launch, he will be in constant touch with ground personnel in charge of the operation. During launch, the G-forces acting on the pilot's body will be no more than he has experienced in conventional jet aircraft. He can abort if anything goes wrong. The pilot monitors every indicator, alert to take any necessary corrective action. His observations are relayed to scientists and technicians following the vehicle's course. The first stage separates and the second stage accelerates the glider to an even greater velocity. Finally, the glider is in orbit. The centripetal force of the dinosaur equals the pull of gravity, and everything is in a condition of weightlessness. In this environment, the pilot will keep the glider oriented by using the reaction controls to maintain or change attitude as desired. There is an inevitable advantage in exposing a man's intelligence to this new environment. For what he learns out there will affect the concept of manned operations in aerospace for years to come. The pilot's greatest challenge will come when he descends through the flight corridor. 
If he loses altitude too fast, the glider will exceed its temperature limits and burn. Now that the air is getting denser, highly heated shock waves develop around the glider. Rudder and elevons respond to the slightest movement of the pilot's controls. He manages the potential and kinetic energy of altitude and speed, maneuvering to hold the temperature of the nose cap and wing leading edges to an acceptable level. The instruments not only tell him where he is, but also indicate what action is to be taken to get back on course. Below, radar eyes watch the sky. As he nears the airstrip, the pilot banks the glider into a 360 degree turn to use up the last bit of excess energy before flaring out for a smooth touchdown. Perhaps now you may sense some of the interplay of men and ideas in industry and government which must be brought together to accomplish the dinosaur experiment. Why are we doing all this? Why dinosaur? Because with dinosaur, we're establishing a new technology that enables us to extend Air Force operational capabilities into the hypersonic and orbital flight regime. Future outgrowths of dinosaur may very well assume vital roles in our national defense. Through this program, we are making use of what we've already accomplished in the missile, space, and aeronautical sciences. Dinosaur is as fundamental to future space operations as were the early experiments at Kitty Hawk. By putting man at the controls, the Air Force has carried forward into space that journey started by the Wright brothers a little more than a half a century ago.